Good evening, church. Good evening. I'm glad to see each and every one of you this morning. Or this evening, excuse me. Still Anyway, uh, if you'll stand, we'll go ahead and get started. Abba Father, once again, we just want to give you the honor, the glory, and praise. We thank you so much that your presence is here already, even before uh, we, we come and open the doors. We know your presence is, is already here, and we just we thank you for coming and dwelling with us this evening as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I thank you for the word that is about to come forth. Be with our beloved pastor as he brings this word for us. Help us to have ears to hear and hearts to receive. And let us see what you can do through him and what you can uh, what you can do through us as we learn what your word says. Not only do we need to remember, Father God, but help us to live it uh, in front of those in our families and friends and our circle of acquaintances. By the works of the enemy, I render them useless and powerless. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, come and dwell with us this evening. And as always, we give you honor, glory, and certainly all of the praise. And we ask all of this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, whom we love and declare. I'll say, Amen. Amen. All righty. Praise the worship team. Let's get out here and do some worship. Hallelujah. Woo! Of this season, we're starting on Christmas songs, so we have one tonight, but uh, we're gonna increase that number as we go get closer to Christmas. <laughs> we're gonna praise our good God Almighty, hallelujah! Yes, amen. Yes, thank you. I can't count the times I called your name some broken night. You showed up and passed me up like you do every time. I get amnesia. I forget that you keep coming around. There ain't no way you Never let me down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praise in your name, no matter where I am. Cause I know where I'll be without your mercy. So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs. Is he good? Jesus, he is he God, he is he is good God Almighty. You say your love goes on forever, that your mercy never stops. So why would I assume you'd be somebody that you're not? I stop in the morning, I know you'll be there every day. What on earth would make me be afraid? Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'll be without your mercy. So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs. Is he good? He's good. Is he God? He's God. He is good God Almighty. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the noontime. Praise him when the sun goes down. Love him in the morning. Love him in the noontime. Love him when the sun goes down. Jesus 
when the sun goes down. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noon time. Jesus when the sun goes down. But still, how great he is, God. Hallelujah. How great thou art, Father God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let the of the earth rejoice. All the earth rejoices. He wraps himself in light, and darkness rises to light. It trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. How great!
mercy and grace. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, Father God. Though we may squander it, Father God, it's a gift nonetheless. Let us use that gift that you gave us. It's the same power that rose Lazarus from the grave. It's the same power, Father God, that Elisha used. Hallelujah. Same power that split the waters open for Egypt to escape for the slaves, Father God. We are so blessed today. Help us not take it Neglect this gift, Father God. Let us use it to the full extent. Hallelujah. I know I was healed this uh, revival. And many others were, Father God. There is nothing impossible for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank, you, Thank you for this gift. In Glory. Jesus' name, we Amen. pray. Amen. 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 Glory. I was 
Que tiene ahí? Que Well, church, we may be few in number, but we're not in spirit. Amen. 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 Seems like it's been forever. Right? <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and start again. We're going to do it to finish up on what I finish up. Continue on our teaching we've been doing about controlling your emotions instead of emotions controlling you. If you will, turn me to John. Verse 3, 3 John, verse 3. Everybody there? 3 John, verse 3. It said, Beloved, tell somebody he's talking to you. He's talking to you. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. And we talked about this every Wednesday night. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's your thinking, your choices, and your feelings. Amen. You know, if we could just overcome in those areas, it'd be amazing what God could do in our lives. Amen? And he says, he wants you to prosper in health, even as, as your soul prospers in the things of God, the Word of God, it changes your thinking so you don't think like you used to. If you don't think like you used to, you don't make choices as you used to. You make better choices. When you make better choices, better things happen in your life. Amen? Amen. And also, as you learn and grow in the Word of God, you no longer let your feelings Amen. control you. Come on. There are a lot of Christians who love God with all the heart. And I've said this on Wednesday night. Oh, I love the Word of God. I, I believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Then they get their feelings hurt. All that's out the door. And they're controlled by their feelings and by their emotions. Amen. All right, let's go over to Proverbs 4. Verse 20. Proverbs 4, verse 20. So my son, attend to my words, incline thy ear to my saying. Let them not depart from thy eyes, keep in the midst of thy heart. For they are life to those that find them, and health, or another translation says, medicine to all their flesh. Amen. You should pay attention. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what my word is saying. You should keep them before your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I need some healing in my, my life and my family, so I need the Word of God. I need to know what the Word says. Amen? We start off now, she says, the Bible teaches us to forgive readily and freely. We are quick to be quick to forgive. You know, she keeps talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the biggest strongholds or biggest hindrance in a Christian's life. I've said this many times. If you're an alcoholic or a drug addict, you know you are. Right. Okay? If you're angry and bitter, you usually know you are. But when you've got unforgiveness in your heart, you don't see yourself that way. It's always somebody else's fault. I'm just going to make a comment that it's probably the reason it's the biggest stronghold is because of pride. Because we, we think we're right mm -hmm. and we're wrong. Or sometimes we think, you know, I'm not going to do it. But God... Shows, showed me when Brian died that's just, just some things that don't matter. And a fight or something like that just doesn't matter. And I have found myself, I take I take the higher road. And I think that's what God wants us to do is to take the higher road. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of who's right and wrong. It's no. a matter of what's going to save you. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Absolutely. That means you may not be wrong, but God's going to bless you by right. trying to initiate yes. peace with someone. Right. Yes. Josh? Um, in the big picture, the grand scheme of things, I don't think any of us are right <laughs> in what we say. No, I mean, right. when we're professing the scripture and the gospel, 
we can be right in that sense, but there's so much more to it that God hasn't revealed to us. And we could be saying something wrong, whether we know it or not. Um, I know I did that object lesson with the puzzle and I gave each person like three pieces of the puzzle. You know, we each have our own part, but together, when we gather together in Christ, that's when truth comes out. Amen. Amen. Pride. Dr. Judy said, a lot of the reason we don't want to say, ask somebody to forgive them, call it pride. We're yeah. stubborn. Yeah. But Jesus said that we're supposed to forgive as he forgave us. Yeah, he right. does it readily. He does it freely. Amen. Amen. According to 1 Peter 5, 5, we are to clothe ourselves with the character of Jesus Christ. Men, we are to be long-suffering, patient, not easily offended, slow to anger, quick to forgive, and filled with mercy. Now, I've said this before. We all want to be like Jesus when he's casting out devils, when he's laying hands on the sick, when he's seeing miracles. Yeah. We all want that part. Yeah. But in order to get that part, you've got to allow his nature mm -hmm. to take over. Amen. To be like him. To walk in forgiveness. To walk in love. The Bible says, faith worketh by love. So if you're not walking in love, your faith is not going to manifest the level that God wants it to manifest. Amen? Amen? He said that, she said, my definition of the word mercy is the, don't you listen to this, is the ability to look beyond what is done to discover the reason why it was done. Many times people do things even they don't understand themselves, but there's always a reason why people behave as they do. Gary and I was talking about this the other day. We should not judge anyone else. First of all, that's God's position. Right. Those exactly. are big shoes to fill. Amen. And two, unless you've walked in their shoes, you don't know why they do what they do. Yeah. You don't know why they behave the way they behave, why Amen. they act the way they do, until you walk in those shoes. Right. Amen. Okay? Right. Yeah. Pastor. Yes, sir. You're talking about like emotional balance and or just balance, period. Because God wants us to find balance in all things. And I was reading last night um, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7. And it says the limits of human wisdom. Uh, chapter 7 verse 15 says, I have seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of good young people and the long life of wicked people. So don't be too good or too wise. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Pay attention to these instructions. For anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. And, I mean, we're all on this journey, and we need to find this balance. And God says you cannot be. I mean, a lot of us think we need to be really good, really wise. And, but, you know, we don't learn anything that way. God is all about balance, church. I mean, right. you go to some churches, they got word, 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 no spirit. You go to some churches, they're all spirit, 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 no word. you got to find balance. Balance in your life. Balance in your walk with God. Right. It can be over over excessive in so many areas, but God wants to be balanced about things. Okay? She said, the same is true of us believers. We're to be merciful and forgiving just as God in Christ forgives us our wrongdoing, even when we don't understand why we do what we do. How would how would we like Christ to treat us the way we treat other people? <laughs> And that's what he does. He says, he, we're supposed to forgive as he forgave us. That's right. And if we're not willing to forgive, then God says he cannot forgive us. That's right. He can't. Somebody said, I'm tired of this old forgiveness stuff. Talk about something else. <laughs> you know what? Fred Price's church one time asked him, when are you going to teach him about faith? He said, when you get it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 10 and 11 says, If you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one. And what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sakes in the presence and with the approval of Christ and Messiah. To keep Satan from getting the advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his wiles and his intentions. The Bible teaches we are forgiven in order to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. When you do not forgive, you leave an open door exactly. for Satan to come in. When, when he when he come before God, he'd say, Well, James is not forgiven, so that gives me legal access, and God has to say, yeah, it does. Until he's willing to forgive, put it on the blood, then the devil comes in, no, no, he's already covered in the blood, he's already forgiven, there's no, no error, you don't have an open door there. But until we forgive, it's an open door for the devil to come in, do what he does, kill, steal, and destroy. You don't have to forgive, you just have to 
know who has the hardest? Men. Y'all have the hardest time. Because James always says to me, it's the principle of the thing. <laughs> right and wrong, black and white. And if they don't, if y'all don't feel like that it's right, then it's hard to let go and say, you know what? It doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. That, that men has, that y'all have such a hard, well, some women, I mean, I have a hard time too, but I'm stubborn, but. Well, I'm going to hear that. Yeah, we <laughs> <laughs> have, have a hard time because we want to justify it. You want to, you know, we want to justify it. We just do. We feel like we have that right to justify it. But we but, do it. We're supposed to do it just because we love God right. and we want to please God. So we do it to please Him, exactly. whether we're right or wrong. Sorry. And you know what? These things that we hold on to, when someone passes away, we're going to beat ourselves up because we wasted all that time holding on to something that didn't really matter. Amen. That's right. Pastor, I'm going to give an example. Um, I did this during prayer, and I just felt like I had to put all my heart and share what happened to me. Forgive people pretty, I think, pretty easy. I think it's myself that I have the hardest time forgiving. But there, there was one person. <laughs> you know, there's only that one. Always one. Yeah. And this one person did something wrong. And um, when I was trying to, you know, when you are offended by something, you go to that person. And I had approached this person and went to them, and they cussed me out. Now, this is years ago. And they cussed me out. And throwing up the way I did, I had never been cussed out before. So I'm now doubly offended. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this person should know better, okay? Well, anyways, I went to pray for this person. Actually, I don't know what I was praying about because this took over. God told me to forgive that person. I said, yeah, but God, they did this, 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 and God, they cussed me out, and God, they did this, and I'm just going with accusations, just uh -huh. hurling them all, giving it all to God. <laughs> uh, I think it's probably the only time I was really fussing towards God, but I was telling God all about how wrong they were. And God's like, forgive them. And he was showing me Jesus Christ getting whipped every time I hurled an accusation. He was just getting whipped with a whip. And I was like, ah, okay. I tried to pray a little bit more, and God's like, forgive them. But God, <laughs> they did this, and they did that, and I saw that whip on Jesus. I saw Jesus get whipped. And um, I was like, you know, I, but God, I kept, but God. And he showed me, finally, I'm the one holding the whip, hitting Jesus on the back. Because this person is supposed to be a Christian. If they're a child of God, then we're not supposed to be accusers. We don't supposed to be accusing you. I right. say especially if you're a child of God. Right. Uh, because accuser of the brethren is the devil. And we're not supposed to be the children of the devil. We're supposed to be children of the most high God. And when he showed me that, I dropped that whip. Okay, God, I'm sorry, I forgive. <laughs> I forgive. I don't want to hurt Jesus. I don't want to hurt him. And when I'm hurting one of my brothers or sisters in Christ, I'm hurting him. Exactly. And I don't want to hurt anybody. And um, especially, especially Jesus. Right. And when he showed me that, the way he showed it to me, I've never been the same. And I just, I know it's best to forgive. And, 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 God shows us to God unforgiveness. We better let that thing go. <laughs> Amen. You know, if someone were to come to my house and they were to hurt my grandkid, I'm going to hurt somebody. Right. You know? Well, you can imagine, we're all God's kids. And we forget that sometimes. And so when we hurt one another, it hurts him. Right. I'll give you an illustration. The other night in the revival, a lady came up for prayer. And the Lord said, when we prayed for the Lord told me she needed to forgive. And he would heal her. And Brother Joe came up and said the same thing. You need to let go and forgive someone. Later on, I talked to, talk to the individual and come to find out she had unforgiveness toward a couple of pastors that were here in the church. She just was having a real hard time letting go of that. My thing is, is it worth missing out on being healed to hold on to your unforgiveness? There again, prosper. Even as your soul prosper, that's a choice. Yeah. Right. You have a choice to make, choose to do what God tells you to do, or choose to continue, leave that door open for the devil to come in. And then we say, God, why you let this happen? God says, I'm not, you are. Right. Amen. Amen. You know, you're talking about an incident, or I had an incident, that same thing, that this person just slaughtered me, verbally just slaughtered me. And, and I was very hurt, and I, I'm telling you, I didn't want to forgive her either, but 
God kept telling me to let it go. And so I was like, okay, let it go. Okay, I'm going to let it go. I'm just going to let it go. I went to walk by that person, and God said, you're not letting it go. And I was like, you want me to hug her and say, I forgive you? Are you kidding me? He said, let it go. And I did. But it was like the hardest thing I ever but you know what? I had such a peace when it was all done. I you just had to you you We had people do some horrible things to us in the ministry. Yes. Talk about us and do some really radical things. But this is one thing I'm a firm believer in. You could do all kinds of things, but when you come back through those doors, I'm going to yeah. love you and I'm going to protect yeah, exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. Because right. I want what God wants right. to do in my life yeah. more than right. I want to hold yeah. on to whatever exactly. you did. Like Jesus said, sometimes they don't even aware of what they do. Yeah. When people start talking about us or saying things against us, they're not talking about us. They're talking about the Christ that's in yes. us because we belong to God. And so when they do that, they're coming against God. And when we forgive, then God says, I will fight your battles. Right. That's right. You know what? So I'd much rather you get in my face than God get in my Amen. face. Amen. Amen. Says, so when we forgive others, not only are we doing them a favor, we're doing ourselves even a greater favor. The reason we're doing ourselves such a favor is because unforgiveness produces in us a root of bitterness that poisons our entire system. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Exercise foresight, foresight to be on the watch to look after one another to see that no one falls back from, the, from and fails to secure God's grace. In order that no root of resentment Bitterness or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment and that many become contaminated and defiled by it. When we're filled with unforgiveness, we are filled with resentment and bitterness. The word bitterness is used to refer to something that is pungent or short to the taste. We remember that when the children of Israel were about to be led out of Egypt, they were told by the Lord on the eve of their departure to prepare a Passover meal, which included bitter herbs, wine. God wanted them to eat those bitter herbs as a reminder of the bitterness they experienced in bondage. Bitterness always belongs to bondage. Whatever controls you is your ruler. Oh, if Jesus controlled me. Then why are you getting mad and upset and bitter about the situation? Obviously it's not because Jesus would tell you to forgive and let it go. That's right. It is said that bitter herbs that the Israelites ate were probably akin to horseradish. You ever had any horseradish? Yes, yes, yes. You ever ever taken a big bite of horseradish? You know it can cause quite a physical reaction. <laughs> Bitterness causes precisely the same type of reaction in us spiritually. Not only does it cause us discomfort, but it also causes discomfort to the Holy Spirit who abides in us. We've seen that we're to be sweet smelling and smelling fragrance to those who come in contact with us. But when we're filled with bitterness, the aroma we give off is not sweet, but bitter. You ever been around someone that's just bitter? Yep. Full of unforgiveness? Oh, yes. <laughs> you ever been around someone that's had cancer? You can almost smell it sometimes. When someone that's got bitterness, you can almost smell it, what they're giving off. How does bitterness get started? According to the Bible, it grows from a root. The King James Version of this verse speaks of a root of bitterness. A root of bitterness always produces the fruit of bitterness. What is the seed from which the root that root sprouts? Unforgiveness. Bitterness results from many minor offenses we just won't let go of. The things we rehearse over and over inside of us until they become blown all out of proportion and grow to a monumental size. How many times somebody done something to you and you said you dwelled on it and you thought about it and you got more upset? And yeah. more upset, the yeah. longer you thought about it, the more you got upset, the more you want to do something to that person. Yeah. Yes, Sweet, dude. Yeah. You have to go to work and there's one car. You work in the same place and you got one person really on fire for God. And you got one that is so bitter. You can't stand to get the car with them. And Oh, time you turn on the Christian radio, they turn it off. You're trying to talk about, well, guess what God did for me today? They don't want to hear it. All they want to do is what she did to me, how I got taken, 
and we just on and on and on and on. You know, the Bible says what we think out with, we become a part of. Amen? Right. Right. Do you not at one time have to stand up and say, I love you with all my heart, but I don't want to hear of that anymore? Yes. Nope. Yes, you do. If, if you yes. truly love that person, then you're going to speak, the Bible says you're going to speak the truth right. to them. Yeah, exactly. so whether they like it or don't like That's it, they right. still need to hear the truth. Because, because they're leaving the door open and Satan's going to come in and do what he needs to do. Amen. And then you tell them, you're affecting me and my walk with God. Yeah. Because yeah. you really are. Yeah. Yes. I can't be around yes. somebody that's negative all the time, that's whining all the time. And Here's some cheese. I mean, it, it just literally, I have to get off the phone and pray for myself and ask God to right. release me from that. Because I get many phone calls that way. If you listen to negative, 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 it rubs off and you begin. I can't be around you. You know, words are seeds. I can't. They are. Yeah. And you're, yes. you're letting those seeds be planted in yeah. your spirit. Put it in there, Joshua. I can kind of attest to that because uh, I, I remember back quite a while ago, I, I dated a girl for seven years and then we got engaged. And uh, I know it was my fault. I thought maybe if we got engaged, it probably could have fixed some issues. But I was a naive kid. Um, well, uh, this is kind of bitter. There was a lot of bitterness between us and we would have fight and argue. Finally, we just broke off the engagement. <laughs> She moved away. And, uh, you know, I started trying to hang out with some old friends that you know I really enjoyed having a fun time. We had a lot of fun together, but then uh, eventually stopped inviting me, and I was trying to understand why. And it's because I didn't know I was depressed from the whole situation. My whole demeanor had changed. I wasn't the same person. And from when I found out, when I asked the why, you know, they've been avoiding me, she's like, because you're just sad all the time. And I didn't know I was. I thought I was over it because, you know, it was somewhat of a relief, a relief that we broke off the engagement because we used to fight all the time, like screaming matches, that type of fighting, really bad. And, uh, you know, I thought I, I was relieved, like there was a burden off of me, but I didn't know I was sad. I didn't know I was depressed. And a lot of times people need to hear it when you talk to them in, in truth and in love. It can help them get out of that hole that they don't realize they're in. Amen. There's a situation with an individual that uh, thought Joe and I was just all that. You know, we walked on water, basically. We just, just loved us to death. And they got their feelings hurt. And now they don't want nothing to do with us or with the church. She and I have not changed. This individual's feelings have changed. And all because of the situation they got hurt. And they do not see themselves what they are. And the sad thing is, a lot of times when we're hurt, we'll find people that will justify it. People that, right. oh, I don't blame you for being that way. I don't blame you for feeling that way. You're wrong. They Just feeding it. If you're a true and true Christian, you won't feed into that. You'll stand up like she said and you'll tell them the truth. A lot of times we'll listen to people that tickle our ears or tell us what we want to hear instead of wanting to hear the truth. You know, I've not run into many couples and they, they were so in love with one another. I mean, they just, you could just see it all over them. They love so one another that they had blended children. And the daughter got mad because the dad spent more time with her. Or the son got mad because, you know, when you do anything for him, you want to do it for me. And I mean, you can see where even there, the devil comes in to kill, steal, and destroy. And the thing is, you can't kick your kid out. I mean, if they're eight years old and they're talking to you stupidly, me personally, and I want the church to know it, they're going over my knee and they're going to give and whip and they're not going to. Yeah. <laughs> At 14 and 15, they did take me on and beat the dog out of me. So that's not necessarily true. But I'm not going to let one of them, not one of my grandsons or ever, going to stand up and call me a filthy word, 
without thinking that I'm not going to slap the ever loving fuck out of me. Now, some people think that I'm just awful. No, I and maybe don't. I am. I do it. But you know what? I was raised that way. And I was taught, you do not talk back to your parents. Exactly. And then my dad believed in that. He believed in anything. And my mother definitely did. And now that she's gone, I can remember back some of the times that I was mouthy with her. And I so regret it. And it's so bad that you can't tell your kids you're going to pay for that one day. And it's, it's going to be in an awful way. You'll never get over it. You'll, you'll be having a great time and all this and that. But guess what? Their birthday's going to come up. Mother's Day's going to come up. And guess who you're going to be thinking about and what you're thinking about thinking? Amen. Amen. You know, in the Old Testament, when a son was uh, disrespectful, uh, basically lazy, didn't do what they were supposed to do, they took them out, and the elders in the city stoned them to death. That's pretty serious. God takes things pretty serious, doesn't he? We're supposed to respect our parents. And I'm going to say something about a blended family. When you have a blended family, when you go into that marriage relationship, I'll come back to you, Jim. When you go into that marriage relationship, you're not just marrying that person, you're marrying the kids too. Exactly. Now, you've got two problems. One, if you're going to marry those, that person, you're going to marry the kids, then you've got to te- treat those kids just like they're your kids. Exactly. Now, the right. parent of the kid, the blood parent of the kids, have to allow the other That's spouse, right. the other parent, to treat their kids the way they would treat their own right. kids. If you don't let them do that, they're never going to be their kids, and they're always going to have a division because yeah. those kids are going to know anytime they yeah. want to do something, they can drive a wedge between the two of you. But you've got to stand united and make the kids realize we're one. This is your father. This is your mother. It may not be blood, but that's who they are now, and they have a right to discipline you. I've seen it so many times. Well, the, you know, Say, for instance, with Joyce, with the boys, they're my adopted kids. Well, if they did something wrong and I was to uh, discipline them, not in our situation, she truly lets me do it. But a lot of times, well, that parent got in trouble from the other parent, and the kids are the ones that caused the division. So you've got to be united, and you've got to realize you're not, it's not her kids. They're, sometimes when they do something, she, she feels responsible. They're my kids. No, they're not your kids. They're my kids too. I raised those kids to, to, the, to the point to where Stephen and Dustin both told me if we ever get divorced, they're going to me. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie? Yeah, but Roger, coming from an abusive. Now, my dad wasn't abusive to all the kids. There were certain ones he picked out. And in my daughter's case, I spanked them one time. And I seen the fear of God in their eyes that time. And I told myself, other than that, my sister, I never spanked them again. But when they got in trouble, they knew they were in trouble. I would take their car away. I'd take their yeah. And you know what? They didn't turn out to be bad kids. No, they didn't. So I don't believe you have to use your hand and all of these things. Uh, some people may believe different. That's why we all have opinions. But I know the way I was raised, and I didn't like it. I didn't do anything wrong. The thing is, your kids have got to respect you. They lose respect for you, and they're going, I'm going to take distance from you. I did the same thing with the boys. I only spanked them boys one time yeah. all of their whole life. Yeah. The rest of the time, I just used my voice. So a lot of times when I tried to discipline, I would try to get in their heart. I'd help, try to help them understand why I'm disciplined and why what they did was wrong and make them feel bad about it because my dad was the same way. My dad believed, you know, like, Bible says the rod of discipline drive the foolishness out of a child. He believed that. He took whatever he could get in his hands, a belt, a board, whatever it was, that's what he whipped you with. I've never had to, I did that one time, and that's the only time I had her. They knew I meant what I said, but they respected me enough because of the life I lived for them. Well, I, I knew growing up, um, I, got, I got a lot of spankings, believe me, and I, you know, each time I really deserved it. But, uh, I don't know, it still, it, it didn't change me. Something changed me. I had to make that change. Yeah. But 
But I don't think the spankings was, but at least it kept me in line somewhat. But uh, I don't know. I, I believe I'm fine today because of it. But, uh, Jim? I think it depends on the child, too, you yeah. know, because I, kn I didn't have to spank my kids very much. I think I spanked them once or twice, and they, even my boys now today, if they have any friends that cuss in front of me, they go, dude, that's my mom. You know, so they're like very respectful. But Joseph was a little smart aleck. And I don't know how many times I popped him in the mouth just because he was being rude and smart aleck to me. And I'm just not going to. So, but I never had to spank Corey. All I had to do was say, Corey, you want to spank him? No, no, no. They quit crying. <laughs> like this, you know? And he quit crying. So it just really depends. And girls are like way, way different than boys, too. So. I just spanked my daughter enough. Yeah, I don't think I spanked her either. I went back to spank Stephen and Dustin that one time. And Dustin got to crying while I was spanking Stephen. And I got to feel so bad I didn't want to spank him, but I felt like I had to because I already spanked Stephen. <laughs> Too bad, so sad. You about got left out. 
Keep Satan from getting advantage over it. Forgive. Do yourself a favor. Let the offense go. Forgive to keep yourself from being poisoned and imprisoned. Wow. According to Webster, the word forgive means to excuse for a fault or offense pardon. When a person is found guilty of a crime and sentenced to serve a prison term, we say that he owes a debt to society. But if he is pardoned, he's allowed to go his way freely with no restraints upon him. Such a pardon cannot be earned. It must be granted by our authority. When someone is offended us, you and I tend to think that person owes us. For example, a young woman once came through the prayer line in one of our meetings and told me she had just caught her husband cheating on her. Her response was, he owes me. When someone has hurt us, we react just as if that individual had stolen something from us or wounded us physically. We feel that person owes us something. That's why Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In Leviticus 25, we're reading about the year of Jubilee, which all debts were forgiven and all debtors were pardoned and set free. When we're, when we're in Christ, every day can be the year of Jubilee. We can say to those who are in debt to us by their mistreatment of us, I forgive you and release you from your debt. You are free to go. I leave you in God's hands and I let him deal with you because as long as I'm trying to deal with you, he won't. Amen. Did you get that? Yes. As long as we're trying to put our two cents worth in, yes. as long as we're trying to fix that situation, yes. God just backs up and says, okay, let's do it. It's once we let go and we forgive that person, then they're in God's hand and God will do what's necessary in his timing and his season to deal with that situation. Okay? According to the Bible, we're not to hold people in perpetual debt just as we ourselves are not being indebted to anyone else. Romans 13, 8 says, Keep out of debt, owe no man anything except to love one another. We need to learn to pardon people, to cancel their debts to us. Can you imagine 
the joy of a person who learns that he's been pardoned from a 10 or 20 year sentence, prison sentence. That's good news of the cross because Jesus paid our debt for us. God says to us, you don't know, you don't owe me anything anymore. There's a song that conveys that thought with the words, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt I did not owe. He did not owe. Our trouble is that we're still trying to pay our debt to the Lord or else we're trying to collect our debts from other people. Just as God canceled our debt and forgave us of it, so we're to cancel the debts of others and forgive them what they owe us. Mark 11, 25 says, says, Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them and let it drop. Leave it or let it go in order that your Father who's in heaven may also forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. He said, when you're standing praying, when you're standing talking to God, the first thing God says you need to do if you've got something against somebody, you need to let go of it. And once you let go of it, then you can come back to God and He'll answer your prayer. But as long as you're holding on to that, your prayers are going to be hindered. The Bible even says over in 1 Peter, the strife between a husband and wife will hinder your prayers. Right. So if you're wondering why your prayer is not being answered, you need to check your heart. Right. So anytime we won't blame God, it's not God that's doing it. Amen. Amen. According to the dictionary, forgive also means to renounce anger or resentment against to absolve from payment. She said, I like the phrase used by the Amplified Bible in this verse. Let it drop. How many times have you had a problem with someone you think you settled it in between you but the other person keeps bringing it back up? My husband and I have those kinds of experiences with each other many times in our life. I believe most men are more willing to, and able to let things go than women. Okay. <laughs> Amen, brother. Preach it. Well, what it is, when a man says, okay, we've, we've, we settled it, a man moves on. A woman wants to rehearse it and talk about it. <laughs> Men don't want to talk about it. Have you talked to my husband? You ever have your wife say, I need to talk to you? And you mean, like, oh, Lord. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what is it now? But women have to, they want to talk it. They want to verbalize. They need to talk it out. For men, they're, okay, that's it. Done, okay. It's over. Let's move on. The popular stereotype of the nagging wife is not entirely accurate. I know because I used to be one of them. Dave and I would have a disagreement or problem between us, and he would say, oh, let's just forget about it. But I keep dragging it up again and again. I can remember him saying to me in desperation, Joyce, can't we just drop it? That's what Jesus is telling us to do here in this verse. Drop it. Leave it. Let it go. Stop talking about it. But the question is, how do we do that? John 20 says, Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me forth, so I am sending you. And having said that, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive it, admit the Holy Spirit. Now having received the Holy Spirit, being led and directed by him, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained. The number one rule of forgiving sins is to receive the Holy Spirit who provides the strength and the ability to forgive. None of us can do that on our own. I believe when Jesus breathed on the disciples and they received the Holy Spirit, they were born again at that moment. The very next thing he said to them was, whatever sins they forgave were forgiven, whatever sins they retained were retained. The forgiving of sins seems to be the first power conferred upon people when they become born again. If that is so, then the forgiving of sin is our first duty as believers. Now this is what I can't understand. In the old days, when you disagree with someone, you just agreed that you disagreed and you kept on going your way and doing your thing. They went there and you still had fellowship with them. Yeah. Now when you disagree with someone, you're supposed to hate that person and have nothing to do with them. Right. That makes no sense to no, me. It right. How are you ever going to reconcile if you don't have anything to do with that person? And just because just because Kat doesn't see something the way I see something, that doesn't give me the right to hate her or her to hate me. Exactly. Amen. But that's the society we live in. If you don't believe this way, then we're going to cancel you out. You, Even in our culture, they want the right to believe the way they believe, but you not, are not allowed the right to believe the way you believe. Right. They, they, Josh is not going to Actually, Kat was going to come in for. You know, on forgiveness, you know, you can't forgive somebody who's hurt you. Right. 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 And. I mean, I've had it in my life. 
And in myself, I couldn't forgive. So I had to go to God and tell him, I, you got to help me. I forgive by faith. And for a while, stuff would rise up, but the name was mentioned, whatever. And then eventually, because I would cast it down, and eventually nothing rose up, so I knew I truly forgave. But I had to forgive by faith because I could not do it. I want to do it by faith and obedience to your word, God. And she's, we're fixing to get in here in just a minute, and she talked about you have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you yeah, to forgive. Oh, okay? And then she also talks about your feelings are always not going to be right there when you forgive that person. But your feelings, if you really sincerely them, your feelings will eventually fall up. We think a lot of times because we still have something inside us we haven't forgiven. If you've done it by faith and you've asked the Holy Spirit to help you, you may have forgiven them, but you, it may take a time for that feeling to catch up exactly. for you. Okay? Just me. That's the initial process of healing. Because the deeper the wound is, yeah, you may forgive, but it's still going to be a process of healing. And, and sometimes it takes a while for the healing. You know, like if I, if I had a scratch on my arm, you know, that's just a little thing. A little bit. Yeah, we choose by God's grace because there's no way we can do it on our own. We choose to forgive. That's like when God did a surgery. And it takes some time, but sometimes to heal. It takes a little bit of time to heal. But we keep choosing to forgive. Like you said, just keep on. So, no, I choose to forgive. I choose to let go. With God's grace and God's help. And then that healing has to take place. And I think that's a process. It is a process. And you know, uh, when you forgive somebody, it's like you let yourself out of prison. Don't you feel a relief yes. that you're not carrying that around anymore? Because yes. it's really a burden. Yes. And it keeps you burdened down. Once you forgive and you let go of it, it doesn't burden you no more. So you're doing yourself a favor as well as doing one that and being obedient to God. She says here, Though we have the power to forgive sins, it's not always easy to forgive sins. Whenever someone does something to me, I need to forgive. I pray, Holy Spirit, breathe on me and give me the strength to forgive this person. I do that because my emotions are screaming and yelling. You have hurt me, and it's not fair. At that point, I have to remember what we have already learned about letting go and allowing the God of justice to even the score and work out everything in the end. I have to remind myself that my job is to pray. His job is to pay. When someone does something hurtful to you, go to the Lord, receive from him the strength to place your will on the altar and say, Lord, I forgive this person, I loose him, and I let him go. Once you've done that, you have to let it drop. It does no good to go through all that and go to lunch with friends or associates and rehash the whole thing. Why? Because Satan will use it as an opportunity to nullify your decision to forgive and rob you of your peace and of your blessings. She said, just go ahead. That's kind of how like we grew up in our family. When one person wasn't there, then all of us would gather and talk about that person. And then it, it just kind of rotated in and out. And somehow, somehow, in our screwed up minds, we would think, that it'd make us feel better because, you know, this person's way worse than us, you know. But, you know, we always just rotated and talked about each other. It was, growing up, it seemed natural, but then, you know, as when I found God and everything, it just really, I'm like, wow, this is really screwed up. <laughs> Until we try to justify, I have a right to feel this way. Not according to God's word, Jack. We didn't have to argue about who the worst was, we knew it. Joy. Joy. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> James 119. <laughs> <laughs> one time we were very, very poor and we had to ride the school bus and Jamie Brandy, my brother in between us, well he's my he's between me and Jamie. And they were both her small. And this gal came after them. And I don't know what they did. It's just been too long. And anyway, man, she was all over them. And I mean, this rage. And, 
And I wish I could call it something else, but I can't. It's a literal rage. Came all over me. And I grabbed that old gal and I threw her down through that bus as hard as I could. And I told her, you touch my brothers again. So help me God, I pray. Like, I'm going to go get buses. So from that day on, she never touched Jamie or Randy again. She never did. Whether I was on the bus or I wasn't on the bus, she knew. I meant business. I hurt the girl. I meant to hurt the girl. I slammed her into the cement pole thing that they had holding up the chairs. But it just infuriated me. I felt like we were so punished as children that for somebody else to come out and try to punish us again yeah. just was not acceptable yeah, to me. And, and in all honesty, if I'm going to be true to this church, that's still kind of that way to that. Yeah. Like, I'm very particular with Jake. I really, really am. If it's something after him or a dog him or something like that, man, I'm, I'm getting in that white car and I'm going, I'm going to fly out there. And, and I mean, and I say that with, with Tui too. I, I really want this couple to survive. I and, and, and I love my brothers and sisters. Several of them are not speaking to me now. They got mad because they didn't come down when uh, I had the seizure. And so they're not speaking to me. But I did reach out to them on Thanksgiving. And I did tell them for me and my family, Happy Thanksgiving. I got a couple of things back and then I didn't hear anything back. But you know, I still love them anyway, and if I found sure. them in a fight and I thought that I could help out, I would get my rear end kicked, but I would go and help them do it. Yeah. And, and, and I know that's probably not Jesus. Pray before you leave. We need to pray. I don't need my husband, my kid. I need my pastor. Jesse the said, Lord, let me just slap him one time and repent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about the, the unforgiveness, and you're talking about the, the person that's just sitting there going over and over again in their heart. And like, especially in the church family, you got somebody doing that, and they find vulnerable people to complain to, and then they start getting riled up. And, you know, is your unforgiveness worth tearing, uh, tearing uh, God's kingdom down? I mean, you, you got uh, people whispering in the uh, baby Christian's ears that don't know better. Mm -hmm. Before you know it, the church is getting torn apart. Mm -hmm. And all you're doing is just tearing God's kingdom down. Yeah. You either build it up or tear it down. Well, scripture says you either build up or you're tearing down. That's, that's what hurts God's heart more than when brothers and sisters in Christ come against one another. You're coming against a part of your body. And I say, if we disagree, then go your way and do what you need to do, what God's told you to do. I'll go do what I'm supposed to do, and we're all going to give account to God anyway. Right. But don't start running. That's what the world wants to see. The world wants to see us divided. The enemy wants us to divide. Divide and conquer. That's how you want it. I got one more page I'm going to get to, and then we're going to have to close on this. It says in James chapter 1, verse 19 Understand this, my beloved brethren. Every man be quick to hear, a ready listener, slow to speak, slow to take offense, and to get angry. It's very important to understand that Satan will bait you even through the mouth of other Christians. Yes. Do you know what they will say to you at lunch? So how are you and so-and-so getting along? I heard you two were having a little problem. See the bait? Yes. Since you're trying to forget it, you may respond, oh no, no harm was intended. But if you're not careful, the others will continue to bait you with questions, drawing you into a conversation about a subject that you have determined to drop. I know how gossip works because in my early years, I could not walk away from some juicy story. Someone would say something to me about somebody else and my ears would practically stand out on my head. I would get all excited. Oh, I'm about to learn a secret. That's the kind of thing that poisons us. Now, whenever anyone begins to talk about someone else or another ministry, I try to turn the conversation in a totally different direction. I pass it off by saying something like, well, I just pray that God will help that person in ministry to work through their problems and learn something from this experience that will make them more powerful than ever. 
When someone comes to you, debates you into talking about some problem in your church or ministry, you need to try to turn the conversation by saying, oh yeah, that's right, we did have a little problem for a while, but as far as I'm concerned, everything is going to work out fine. Amen. Amen. If that person insists on asking, insists on asking how things are going, let him know politely but firmly that you're not going to discuss it negatively in any way. Yep. The Bible says where there's no tail bearer, the fire goes out. That's right. Amen. Okay? Amen. Uh, it reminds me of uh, this one comedian. Um, he was talking about how he loves gossip. You know, going to work. That, that's the only thing he liked about going to work was gossip. And, you know, we kind of trained up as kids to learn to gossip in the sense that, you know, if you've ever heard a little kid trying to tell a story, they just go on and on. And it's not, like, too interesting. And so there's no reaction, really, from the, the adult that the kid's talking to. But once a kid has, like, a story that has some interest that sounds like gossip and the person lights up, then they're like, oh, I need to get more stories like that. Because I've never gotten a reaction like that. That's what they want to hear. As Christians, when someone starts talking negatively about somebody, and you sit and listen, you're letting them pour poison into your spirit. You need to walk away. That person is actually hurting you because you're listening to negative stuff. And the next time you see that person, what are you going to remember? What negative thing? Not all the positive things they did, the negative thing. I've said this for years. You can do a hundred things right, one thing wrong. People don't remember that one thing wrong. Josh, you something. Well, I mean, recently, uh, I have I had some friends that I'm trying to be careful with it because I'm, I'm not trying to gossip. Um, <laughs> I had some friends that let, uh, weren't showing up, and I was like, "Are you okay? Are you okay? They're not getting back. They're not getting back." And. Um, I was trying to figure out, I was asking around because they weren't getting back to me. And I mean, is it gossip if you're asking around what's going on, what happened, is, are they okay, that type of thing? No, there's nothing wrong with that. Because you're, you're, you're genuinely concerned about what's going yeah. on. It's when you spread something negative that somebody else has told you, yeah. that turns into gossip. And a lot of people write it off, well, I just want to tell you so you can pray about it. It's still gossip. Now, if you sincere say, hey, they really need prayer, just tell them, hey, God, they need prayer. You need to pray. And if God wants you to, he wants to reveal to you what is going on, what's going on, he will reveal it to you. But you don't have to be detailed about things. Okay? One last time. Can you tell that joke that three preachers went to? <laughs> and one had a problem with... Oh, something. there's three, three um, ministers, a rabbi and Priest and uh, Baptist. Catholic, yeah. And they were all shut up in a room and they began to share things. And this one uh, pastor said, I've got a problem with uh, drinking. I like to take a drink every now and then. And the other one said, I got a problem with uh, pornography. I have a problem looking at things I shouldn't be looking to. And the third one says, Well, I have a problem with gossip. I can't wait to get out of here so I can tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't tell good jokes, I read them better. <laughs>